So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Joy Midlin, and some of you may know me. I am the chair of the Dublin City North uh, Children and Young People Service Committee. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to our webinar around resilience and mental toughness for managers. So I'm really welcoming you on behalf of the Mental Health and Wellbeing subgroup of the SIPSI. And that subgroup is chaired by Angela Walsh, who is, people may know, as the head of mental health services for Dublin City and Council County in the HSC. But um, unfortunately, just due to a short notice, due to unforeseen circumstances, Angela wasn't able to be here. Um, so I am, I'm going to chair today and I'll be part of the panel that we have with Carl after he has done his piece. So um, today, I suppose we really had wanted to do a session around trying to support managers um, in dealing with both the impact that COVID has on their client group, but also on their staff. And so we know that COVID has had a huge impact on our communities, on our children and young people and their families. Um, just yesterday, SIPSI launched a report on a piece of research that we did with young people around the impact of COVID. So I think most of us as managers will have a good sense of how COVID impacts on those we work with. But it also has a big impact on our staff. And we're not immune to COVID. And our staff have their own worries and anxieties about it. They, we have maybe limited staff available to us. Um, some are able to work from home, some aren't, some are able to come to the office. So they have their own personal challenges, I suppose, with COVID as well. So it's a really kind of a difficult environment that we're in, both personally and professional, professionally. So um, we are delighted to have Carl because I know that we will get some tools and insight into how we can build our own professional resilience and to lead in the midst of this pandemic. Leadership is just such a crucial aspect of how people can manage in such difficult circumstances. Um, I won't make any current comment around leadership, but I think all of us know that the impact of bad leadership can be very visible. Um, and sometimes good leadership isn't seen quite as clearly, but it's absolutely essential in supporting staff and delivering quality services. And it's something I personally feel really strongly about and hopefully we'll be able to talk a bit about at the um, panel at the end. So for today, I really would love people to just take this time that's available. Um, sometimes we're very busy, um, particularly as managers, we've a lot of demands on our time. And this is a two hour slot where it's really some self care for us to focus on it, turn off the emails and the phones if possible and to, to get the benefit of Carl's expertise. And I think you really will enjoy it. Um, so really for today, uh, we already mentioned just about the Zoom piece and we are recording this so that it'll be available on the SIPSI website. Um, we're not gonna record the Q&A part, but we'll record um, Carl's presentation. So if people want to turn their mics and their cameras off for now, um, and if you do have any questions or comments that you want to make throughout any point of the presentation, if you put them in the chat box, Kleena is going to gather them up so that we can put them as part of the panel at the end. So um, I'm delighted to have Carl Hyden here. He is a master certified coach and licensed mental toughness and resilience trainer. And he has extensive experience in social and public services. So the kind of work that we do, he's worked as coordinator for services for the unemployed in Cork, as well as um, working as a regional enterprise mentor and career coach with the DASP. So he's lectured and guest lectures in TU Dublin and UCC and most recently in the UCD Professional Academy. And he's been delivering these kind of webinars to global audiences on professional resilience. So I know that there is so much that, that we all can learn from Carl. Um, so do submit questions. Um, we will have about, I think Carl will be presenting until about 3.30. And then we'll have a chance to just have some panel discussions based on the questions that come up. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Carl. And again, I just hope you enjoy this. And I hope that... Um, you are able to maybe take away some of the distractions of your work to really focus on this for these two hours. So over to you, Carl. Fantastic, great. Just an honor, uh, complete honor to be here in that today. Thank you so much, Joy. So I'm just uh, advancing the slide there. 
So I just want to thank you all and, and, and thank Lena and, and all the members of the um, Mental Health and Wellbeing subgroup and that for inviting me here today and that my name is Carl Hyden. I'm delighted to be working with you over the next while and to provide you with what I hope you will find to be a truly unique and impactful program today. Uh, I know that you'll gain a lot from our session and I look forward to sharing quite a lot of materials, models, tools, all that sort of thing for you to help you build your own personal resilience as a manager to benefit yourself as well as your staff and those around you and beyond. Over the past few months with all the shift to online meetings and in your, in your search for credible information, I can only guess that you're just about webinared out of it at this stage, but hang in there. I promise that, that your time will be well spent today with us. You've probably noticed every other LinkedIn article or newspaper article or Facebook post or that talking about the R word. And by R, I mean resilience, of course. So much so that that word has kind of almost lost its meaning. There's so many different takes on what that is and it's being applied to you know, frivolous things as well as very serious and important things in that. So you know, with so much pop and light information out there about resilience this and res resilience that, we wanted to make sure that we provided you today with factual evidence-based oh, okay. tools. Okay, it's okay, I have a show, sorry, thanks. thanks. That's great, thanks. good stuff. And just, just a quick reminder for everybody to, to, to mute, your, mute yourself and, and, and your cameras and that, so that um, for the recording we have, um, um, you know, we have uh, the uh, things as they are. So this webinar is not fluff or about pop psychology or that. It's very much grounded in brain science, positive psychology, mental toughness practice, and research into resilience. Good. So who am I? Well, um, thanks for the introduction, Joy, and that, you know, I'm Carl Hyden. I'm originally from Texas. Um, and where my first life was as a professional classical and jazz musician. I married a Kerry woman who came over to find me. I keep telling her uh, she disputes that. But anyway, uh, we moved to Ireland 25 years ago to raise our three children who are all pretty much grown up at this stage. I've been involved in coaching, mentoring, training, and consultancy throughout all that time. And I have a, two businesses. One is Cadenza Group, through which we bring you this webinar here today, but also the family business unit. And it's in these businesses that I apply my trade, as well as lecturing, uh, as Joy meant, uh, as Joy said, uh, said uh, in programs in Ireland and, and, and further afield. I have the proud distinction of being a master coach. There's very few of us in the, in the, in the country or in the world in that. And I've also had the pleasure of working with um, many of the thought leaders in mental toughness and resilience development over the past 20 years or so. Essentially, I'm just saying those things because I want you to feel comfortable that you're in good hands during our time together today. So let's look at what we'll cover in our session. There's gonna be four main chunks that we'll be looking at. One is the context for resilience. And the next one is how resilience works. We're gonna look at how you can build resilience right now, today from this webinar onwards, uh, but also looking how you can build future resilience. And that will culminate with us talking about the elements of your own personal resilience action plan that you can put together, start putting together and pulling together so that you can begin to implement some of the things that we cover. We all know we've all been to seminars and workshops and all that and it was great in the, in, in the, in the moments that we were there and then the information sits on a shelf or on our computer never to be touched again. So we want to try to prevent that from happening and encourage you to implement these things. So we have a few um, ways of doing that that we'll talk about later. So my goal for the course is to help you become familiar with the topics of stress and recovery and resilience and how they can be used and developed for your advantage. And I want to provide you with a range of mental toughness models, tools, and exercises to help you develop your resilience now and in the future long after this course. And I want to help you to understand how all this can be useful to support you in your work and life. I'm not promising a panacea that's gonna cure all of our pandemic issues and um, and problems and, and complications that we have. But, I, but I, what I have is some very useful and powerful tools and techniques that you can start using from today that will start to help you have more ability to bounce back, more ability to, to hang in there, more ability to support those around you as well as yourself uh, as you move forward. So I would invite you to consider what your own outcome is that you would desire for this session today. And maybe just make a note of that and, and notice, you know, are, are we meeting those needs or are there other needs 
um, that the, the are other ways that we can be focusing the information that but just just to clarify you know to kind of have your own goal for today in that at the heart of it I'm a practitioner so none of this stuff about resilience is of use to me unless I can find a way to put it into practice and so it's in that spirit that I offer you this material today and even if just one part of one idea appeals to you or makes sense to you go with that use that develop it adapt it for your own circumstances it will make a difference uh, for you over the long term and i want to just acknowledge and recognize some of the inspirations that i've drawn from uh, and the influences to put this material today uh, together today um, some of it's mainly drawn from um, the research and work of peter clough and doug straharchik in the uk on mental toughness as well as Martin Seligman's work on positive psychology, mental toughness and flourishing, and also Rick Hansen's uh, very practical work in developing and curating tools and techniques for resilience development. So they would be resources that, um, that you may be interested in as well. <clears throat> you're, you're probably very well experienced at this stage of the whole uh, webinar game, but just for good measure, I'd like to share with you a few tips uh, for getting the most from the presentation today. So the first thing is to just have a way of taking some notes if you if you like to take notes in that. Some people like to do that, some people just like to absorb and, and that. There will be a video later, a uh, video recording later available so you'll be able to kind of go in deep in that because I'll be covering a lot of material and probably covering it quite fast to try and get it all in so you can go back and review that. But please just be aware of copyright and intellectual property on some of the models and tools in that. So please reference appropriately if you decide to share any of the material or information anywhere. Feel free to share it, but just you know to, to source it in that. I've tried to vary the slides to those from those with just images to those with a few words to those with a lot of words and detail to account for different people's learning styles and the way that people like to take notes or that. I've also included summary slides at each of the different sections to help us kind of take a breather and kind of help you to kind of be able to absorb and catch up and, and think about what you've just learned in, in the previous section and that. And as Joy suggested, you know, consider minimizing distractions, you know, putting the phone on silent for a bit, you know, shutting off the notifications and all that sort of a thing, not sending those emails right now or whatever. Um, why not give this time to prioritizing, prioritizing yourself and your learning and your own self-care, you know, almost as a mini break for your work, um, from your work and other activities. Like they say, a, a break is as good as a rest. I'll pause and recap at various stages of the presentation to help you have that time to absorb and digest, but we will be going at full pace in that. So uh, apologies if, if, um, um, if, I, if I'm running through some things uh, fairly quickly in that. Okay, and as jo sorry, as Joy said, that we will have um, we will have a Q and A at the end. Okay, so Kleena is my co-pilot for the session. I'm not getting any uh, messages that my hair is on fire or anything like that. So I'm going to go ahead and just keep plowing ahead. So how did I become interested in resilience? Well, I'm very glad that you asked. Thank you very much. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, way back before the days of video games, I got a present of being of a, of a little spring toy, kind of similar as the blue one uh, on the screen there. And you notice there's a little suction cup that you, that you squeeze down the toy and it's, it suctions to the bottom of it and it had little animal heads on it like, you know, bears and monkeys and that sort of a thing. And, you know, I was intrigued and delighted by the toy because I'd push it down, I'd condense it down, I'd squeeze it down to the base and it'd sit there for a few moments, kind of struggling a little bit. And then because there was a plastic suction cup there, eventually the spring would win out and suddenly boing, it would bounce up and pop up again and spring up in the air. And I could do that over and over again. And it was great fun and all that. But no matter how many times I squashed the little head down to the base, after a moment, the power of the spring would win again and again and again. And it was impossible to overcome the fact that no matter what, the toy would always bounce back because there was a spring inside. And then when I was a bit older, around 10 years old or so, I got into martial arts because Bruce Lee was on the scene and you know, there was karate and kung fu everywhere. And as we know from the song, everybody was kung fu fighting. And, but what I, when I'd watched these kung fu masters, particularly the Shaolin monks, I'd be almost intrigued as how they kept their cool and focus when they were doing all these extreme things or things were happening around them or to them and that. 
And it was like they were resting in the eye of a storm of the busyness that was happening around them and nothing was shaking their inner calm. And that's when I became more interested in what was going on inside them than with the moves or the punches or the kicks or that. And I would later learn that a lot of that is the foundation for the development of mental toughness and resilience. And after an opportunity to study with a few of the Shaolin monks, I learned that a lot of what they do boils down to our ability to control our thoughts, emotions, and impulses in ver various circumstances. And they would do so by often some very simple exercises. And by doing that, they would allow their natural innate re resilience to return, to spring back, just like the toy that I had as a child. And while these performing meditating monks, you know, um, while they're doing these activities, there, there's been a lot of research over the last few, few decades and we've been able to categorize what they're doing as maybe mental hardiness and emotional resilience, uh, things that are now included in as stock parts of positive psychology programs or mental toughness development or sports psychology or, or the like. So I'm very fortunate to have a keen interest in um, resilience and mental toughness for most of my life uh, because I've had to put it into use in my personal and professional life like when I changed careers by relocating to Ireland and there was nothing like what I did before and I had to completely retool and, uh, and that. And during the last recession, when my business disappeared overnight, all the government contracts you know, went away very quickly uh, during the recession and that. And when my wife was hospitalized on and off for mental ill health uh, over a number of years, I had to apply a lot of the, the tools and techniques. And last year, even when I was diagnosed with stage three bowel cancer and overcame it in, in that, and then when I was re-diagnosed this April with stage four bowel cancer, um, you know, just as COVID was taking off, I had to use a lot of these tools and techniques, hence my fancy haircut. So I know that the models and tools that I'll be sharing with you today really work. They work for me, my family, my clients all over the world, regardless of culture or, or um, gender or anything like that. But it takes a bit of practice and repetition over time uh, to, to really get the value from and the benefit from these things, but I know that, that you will benefit from them as well. So before we get into nit the nitty gritty of resilience, I just want to do give you a couple of examples, I suppose, of some simple exercises that will help get you into a good frame of mind and receptive for our work together. The first is a short awareness exercise. So if you'd like to, notice what your mood is like right now. You know, if you're a bit stressed or distracted, or maybe you feel happy and perfectly fine. So whatever your mood is, just notice it. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I'd like for you to notice your surroundings, but don't react to anything or, or get, you know, um, drawn into anything. Just notice things only. Perhaps fix your gaze on something shiny near you, something that the light is reflecting off of like the image I have on the screen right now. And notice particularly your breathing, just how it's going right now. You don't have to change it or anything, just notice how you're breathing. And notice any thoughts going on in your head. If there's negative ones, you can simply say stop and divert your thoughts to something more useful and supportive to you right now, like a thought about something or someone that makes you smile perhaps. And fix your gaze back to that one shiny thing that you've been looking at and notice the qualities of it, the color, the shape, the outer edge of it. And while you do that, perhaps notice that you can allow your shoulders to just relax a little bit. You can deepen your breathing just a little bit, all while gazing at the object uh, in front of you. And some people find that they feel, I suppose what they feel like is that things inside of them start to settle, kind of like a freshly pulled pint of Guinness just settling down, all the bits coming back together in, inside them. And again, if any negative thoughts come up, simply say stop. And again, divert your thoughts to something positive, to something helpful, to something or someone that makes you smile. Okay, so bring your focus back to the slide on the screen if it wasn't there already. Okay, what we did there is we used two mental toughness uh, techniques and exercises for developing baseline resilience. You're probably familiar with them, you know, there are aspects of mindfulness and, uh, and other things like that. But 
we're, we're using them in a slightly different matter. It's not, it's not rocket science, but they are very powerful. The light focus exercise helps us to control our thoughts and control our physiology and to control our focus. So there's three bonuses in one. And the stop technique is very deceptively simple, uh, but it's a very powerful technique borrowed from cognitive behavior. It borrow, it, I suppose its power lies in the fact that it allows us to become aware of and interrupt the automatic chain of thoughts that are constantly running in our heads. It's the mental equivalent of pruning our thoughts so that we can choose ones that are more conducive to the positive outcomes that we want. So how, how these both support resilience development is simple. If we think of a bucket of water and our random thoughts are little holes in that bucket, letting the water drip out and our negative thoughts are like bigger holes, letting more water pour out. And after a while, the level of the water in the bucket gets very low and attempts to refill it are pointless because there's holes in the bucket. So our resilience is like the water. These exercises help to patch up some of the holes in the bucket and practice repeatedly over time. And in conjunction with some of the other things that I'll share with you today, you'll retain more and more of your resilience in your bucket. And, there, and, and that will be important whenever you need to use a lot of resilience to deal with the situation, you'll have it there uh, ready and at hand. But if your resilience is leaked out, you might not have as much as you need when you need it. So keeping that in mind, let's, uh, let's do another little exercise to warm up your brains a little bit. So I have an image there on the screen in front of you, and I just invite you to decide what, what is it that you're seeing? Some people will say, oh, well, I see a couple of rabbits facing to the right. And other people will say, well, actually, I see a couple of ducks facing to the left. And who's right? Well, who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll explore this a little deeper. If I move the object slightly, you can kind of see the difference between them. The one, the, the, the um, I suppose the, um, the image on the right looks more like a rabbit because of the way it's facing. The image on the left looks more like a duck because of how it's facing. But essentially, both images are exactly the same. It's our brain and toggling back and forth between seeing it's a rabbit or a duck that is making the change in meaning and the change in understanding of that. And it's helping us to understand that how we think and how we see uh, things you know, determines how we, how we interpret the events or how we interpret what we're seeing. <coughs> Excuse me. So here are the both images up there side by side. It's important to note that even the slightest shift in how we see something can change its meaning completely, can change it from one animal to another, even though it's the same image. So we can see the same thing two different ways. The only thing that changes is our perception. So it's just a little exercise there, a little fun thing that we can do. So now that we have your brain warmed up a little bit, let's get stuck in. Here's a lovely quote here from the, the founder of, or I suppose the creator of this concept of flow or the flow state, uh, Mihal, uh, Csikszentmihalyi. And it says, the ability to take misfortune and make something good come of it is a rare gift. Those who possess it are said to have resilience or courage. So what is resilience? What do you think it is? What comes to mind when you, when you think of that word? Like I said earlier, it's being used for everything nowadays in every situation from you know, organizations to people to products to services to, to whatever. So do you think it's a person or qualities? How would you describe what it means to be resilient? How have you experienced being resilient in yourself? Well, as it ha ha happens, I have a couple of definitions there that I'll share with you. From the American Psychological Association, resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. So I've highlighted a number of words there. Uh, adapting well, it's a process in the face of stress and bouncing back. And just notice those because there will be reoccurring themes that come, come up uh, in future um, things that we'll be covering that. Another dictionary definition is that resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It's about toughness, uh, an ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. Okay, so in, in, uh, towards another further definition from the Harvard Business Review, so resilience is the ability to recover from setbacks 
adapt to world change and keep going in the face of adversity. So we have a lot of overlapping things here. So we have recover quickly, we have toughness, which is, I suppose toughness, I'm not, isn't meaning in the macho sense of the word, but it's more meaning of, if you, can, if you can recall, maybe when you were a child, beginning of summer, shoes come off, you're running around, your feet are very sensitive, but by the end of the summer, your feet have toughened up uh, and are able to walk over gravel or, or, or whatever else. It's that sort of toughness. It's a toughening up of, of things. Uh, we also have these ideas of adjusting easily to change, ability to recover from setbacks, adapt well, and this idea of recovering well in opposition to something or despite something challenging. So that's, that's an interesting piece of, uh, of the puzzle in that. So a more ancient view of that is that we fall down seven times and we get up eight. So this whole sense of resilience has been, you know, a part of, uh, you know, human culture, you know, going back, you know, a long time. We've noticed this thing that we can hang in there. We can, we can, you know, uh, I suppose with tenacity, we can hang in there and with commitment, we can keep coming back despite a re repeated challenge or problem, or as we'll refer to it, uh, oftentimes bouncing back. So what is it that we're being resilient in response to? Our definitions mention adapting well in the face of stress, keep going in the face of adversity. So what is it implied that we're facing? And if you want to boil it all down, what it really comes down to, whether we call it adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, whatever, it all boils down to stress, pressure, and challenges of some sort, whether they're positive or negative. And we often focus on the negative because that tends to require us to expend more energy to deal with them. But the ones that we consider to be negative stressors, negative pressures, and negative challenges seem to drain our resilience the most and the quickest. And these provide a counterbalance to resilience. Without them, we wouldn't recognize even having the need to be resilient. So taking the example of the spring toy that I mentioned uh, earlier, stress, pressure, and challenges are the act of squeezing or compressing the spring of that toy. So when we consider building our resilience, it's in relation to things that we're finding stressful pressurizing are challenging that we must first consider. So let's take a few moments and look at our work context. So why have all these things been hot topics over the past number of years in discussions and organizations? You know, have you noticed the workplace becoming more stressful than years ago? Is society more stressful than it was years ago? And to play devil's advocate, are things really more challenging than before? And you'll probably be answering, well, yes, and also no, in some ways. Life happens at a faster pace um, than ever before, but, you know, even before, even during quarantine, I suppose, um, you know, things were happening fast and, and, and that, and they're happening fast now. We've adapted very quickly to Zoom and, and different ways, and we're still adapting. We haven't quite figured out how we're going to manage this whole thing and how we're going to get our work done in, in, in the current circumstances. But our work happens more rapidly, we're more switched on, we're more connected, we're more contactable and all that. But at least for most Western countries, life has generally gotten safer. So you'd think that safety might translate in a into a reduction of stress, but it doesn't necessarily. Or are we just believing things are more stressful and then believing our own self-propaganda? Well, no, I think that things are stressful in certain ways. I don't know, but uh, you know, our clients, whether organizations or individuals, you know, say to us all the time that they experience more stress ever before uh, than ever before, and they seem to be have less resilience to deal with them. So resilience is coming up time and time again there. And so there's lots of risks that we face every day in organizations, organizational pressures and stresses, things and from doing our work, you know, personal stresses. And this is all before any type of adding a, a, pan a pandemic on top of things. So all these things are operating and they're, they're big things, they're small things, they're constant things happening, dripping in the background, just eking away at our resilience and our energy and that siphoning it off. So siphoning it off um, you know, it's kind of like leaving the, the lights on in your car overnight or that, you know, it's just little things that just kind of drain that battery until it's eventually flat and we can't go anywhere. But if we notice that these stressors are there and acknowledge them, then we can learn to counter their drain with some of the tools and techniques that I'll see later, uh, that I'll share with you later. So we'll all see them, don't worry. So 
here are a few more ways of identifying work stress so that you can begin to recognize its role in your daily work. And I know that you already realize some of these things, but we just want to kind of take a moment and, and look at them for a moment. So there's things like the organizational culture and our perceptions of how we do things around here. And into that comes, you know, leadership styles, as Joy was mentioning earlier in that. There's different experiences of stress, you know, in teams or in industries or job sites or that. There's different types of stressors. So it just seems to be that like there's so much out there. And it's all ramped up during times of, of challenge and, and that which we were experiencing before pandemic, which is all the time. And now we have pandemic on top of that. And we're trying to figure out another layer of complexity. And not surprising, before the pandemic, the, the World Health Organization just describes stress as the coming global health epidemic. So I'm not sure what they're, what they're voicing is now about this with the coronavirus. But so, so we have two concurrently running um, health epidemics happening. And that's without the, the, the pending mental health uh, epidemic that they predict is, is going to be coming as well as a result of people being uh, quarantined and locked down in that. So there's so much happening there. And we can oftentimes feel like we have no control or no say so or no ability to, to deal with these things. But, but we in fact do. But let's take another look at you know, I suppose we're living in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. And then we're adding pandemic on top of that. So all these things are happening at a global level. So it's not just us experiencing in that, uh, these things. So people are naturally stressed by, um, um, yeah, pe people are naturally stressed by VUCA type situations. Uh, but we can learn to not react negative, negatively to the stimuli. And that's the key is how do we respond to these things as they're constantly being uh, put on us and that. Okay. So, but like the Shaolin monks, we can learn to bolster our defenses. We can strengthen ourselves mentally and emotionally to not let stress, pressure, challenges drain our resilience as much as it does. And like I said earlier, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing you a, a panacea or anything like that but tools and techniques to help to slow that drain down, to help kind of build up our uh, resilience stores in that. Another interesting piece of research from, from Harvard Business Review showed that even in the midst of a VUCA uh, uh, world of work, people in organizations reported that their resilience, now this is prior to the coronavirus, reported that their resilience was more drained by their relationships with their coworkers than necessarily by global threats. So effectively, what they were saying is they were more stressed about the person uh, that was borrowing and not returning their stapler or not responding to their emails in a timely fashion or a difficult coworker or that, or the person that microwaves prawns in the canteen than they were by the recession, uh, the past recession or terrorism or global threats like that. So perhaps this will change a bit now with COVID. Um, and remote working and, and all that, but people have a tendency to focus on what's happening in their immediate environment more than sometimes the, the, the wider environment. So we forget about all these stressors and the effects that they have on us. So it's important that we acknowledge those so that we can counter them in some way. The main thing is, I suppose, the main takeaway from this is that if we're focused on things that are around us, then we then we are able to do something about it because how we how we respond to them is within our own uh, sense of control. So to summarize a few things that we've covered in that is that we have a number of definitions for resilience, which basically mean and boil down to resilience being the ability to recover from setbacks, adapt well to change, and keep going in the face of adversity. And we can consider resilience in relation to stress, pressure, and challenges. We're faced with many types of stress in the workplace, from global ones to more localized ones. Stress causes businesses and economies millions without even counting the cost to us personally in terms of our health and our well-being in that. And best of all, you've learned that you can stop negative thoughts and also change your perception about seeing a rabbit and a duck. So there you go. There's so many wins so, so far already. So, so far, uh, we've covered a number of, th of things. We're going to start getting into models soon in that. Uh, but I just wanted to pause for a moment so that you can kind of reflect on what we've done so far. So what have you learned so far about, your, about the relationship between resilience, work, and stress? 
And you might jot a few ideas down if you want to, or a few notes, or just consider it. How could you use this learning to your advantage personally and at work? And what questions or thoughts are coming up for you as we move into the next section? And again, just take a moment to reflect on that and see what's coming up for you. Jot down whatever you want to do. And now for more important bits. Okay, we have a third exercise here. What do you see in this picture? I know it seems kind of silly. I'm showing you silly pictures and all that sort of thing. There is a value to it, I promise you. I, I wouldn't be wasting your time in that. But what do you see in the picture? Some people will see a wheelie bin. Well, everybody sees a wheelie bin. But what I mean is, you know, can you see the wheelie bin hovering in midair? Or can you see the wheelie bin sitting on the footpath? The trick is to look at the wheel and notice that it's sitting on the footpath if you want to see the wheelie bin sitting on the footpath. Now again, like we did with the rabbit and duck, toggle back and forth a few times between the two ways of seeing this image. Because what you're doing is you're training your brain to see the same situation in a couple of different ways in that. So you can notice the bin hovering in the air and then you can notice the bin sitting on the footpath. Okay, can you do that? Some people find it easy, some people find it difficult but it, is a, a, it can be a bit of a, a, a brain teaser in that for you. More will be revealed later about why this exercise is important in, in I suppose, uh, developing your resilience in that. But just so that you know, I suppose, to put you, put you at ease in, in that, the bin is actually sitting on the, on the pavement. It's not hovering, it's not magic or anything like that. It's an optical illusion that's, uh, that it's hovering and it's due to the force perspective created by the stain uh, in the foreground there that looks like a shadow. So fun fact is that if you place your hand over the right hand, the, the right hand side of the bin, it looks like it's hovering. But if you change and put your hand over the left side of the bin, it looks like it's on the footpath. So much of our experience comes down to perspective and interpretation. And I suppose that's the underlying message that I'm trying to do here. But we can use these exercises as ways of developing flexibility in our ability to see um, situations um, and, and explore them more fully. Anyway, we're moving to the second part now, which is how resilience works. Now, I've got a lot of models here for you, and I'll be you know, whipping through them and all that. Again, they're, they'll be on the, the recording if you want to review them, and that, but I'll be kind of going at pace through these. So let's get started. First thing to, um, um, I suppose, look at there, there's a nice little song lyrics here that I just like to re re recall in these sessions. It says that she was unstoppable, not because she did not have failures or doubts, but because she continued on despite them. Again, that kind of sums up one aspect of resilience. Here's a cartoon that I think is uh, a little appropriate here. It says, I'm gonna stay here to the change changes. I suppose I, I'm using this because oftentimes as humans, we don't always react well to change. We kind of dig our head in the, in the sand oftentimes and we kind of wait for it to pass us by or, um, or, or we try to not engage with it as a way because we're not sure about it or it creates fear or whatever it is. So there's all sorts, all sorts of automatic physical, emotional, and psychological reactions that start happening to change. Some we notice like being nervous or getting ratty with others, and others are more silent, like an increase in coping mechanisms, like overeating sugary or fatty foods or alcohol or nicotine consumption or those sorts of things. Um, it was interesting to note that when COVID began and we went through Easter, there was news reports that how, because people were quarantined in that, alcohol consumption uh, went up hugely in that because people were trying to cope with this new stressor, didn't know how to deal with it in that. We've survived everything the planet and life has thrown at us, uh, humans, since we became, well, human, but it takes its toll on us. And it's that that we're trying to deal with, with building our resilience. It's trying to minimize that toll that all this stuff takes on us so that we can perform better, we can perform more you know to to the level that we want to be performing in that in our work and in life and all that and with our current pandemic environment it's only normal that we'd feel increases in our stress levels but let's understand what's going on when we're confronted with significant change or loss 
of something that we consider significant, like our freedom of movement or you know, contact with others in that. And it's the process of the change and loss. Uh, uh, we'll, co we'll go into a curve later, but we're going through the stages now. You'll recognize this as being drawn from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work on death and dying and grief and that. So this has been adapted for organizations and, and that. So we'll, we'll go through these different stages. So oftentimes there's, there's an initial relief th that happens when, when something happens. So like when uh, people were unsure when uh, there was going to be a lockdown initially. You know, there's almost a, a sense of relief and frustration, of course, the sense of relief that, okay, it's happened now. I've, I've got something concrete that I can work with. But when it was ambiguous, it was like, okay, what's happening? I don't know how to respond or react in that. Another stage that people go through, that we go through, is that kind of sense of shock or mobilization. You know, so there's that initial kind of thing of what do I do and I'm not sure what, what's happening and that can put us into a sense of uh, being immobile and unable to move forward. <clears throat> Another stage is that we move through is kind of denial that things are happening or searching for a way around it to avoid it or anger or low energy around self-doubt or being kind of low or depressed or that in some way. We can go through those stages back and forth uh, at times eventually we'll move hopefully to a stage of acceptance of accepting that things are really happening this way um, and then we'll start to kind of test out okay what do we do about that and then in the bigger picture we try to search for meaning because our brain is constantly trying to uh, extract meaning from uh, situations that we're in and hopefully we eventually get to this new stage of integration and renewal as we as we move forward in that um, it's not guaranteed that we go through the steps in that order. Sometimes we cycle back and all that, but it's a process that applies to unwanted or sudden change and it creates the sense of loss or even a need to bereave the loss of what was or what won't be. And we're caught in the middle of that. You can see around the world, people are in different phases of that right now in response to coronavirus. So there's some people saying, well, there is no coronavirus. It's fine. It's, you know, it's not going to affect me or whatever. Other people are angry about, you know, being, you know, having uh, their, their, their movements kind of restricted or wearing masks or what have you. Other people are kind of taking it quite hard and it's causing, you know, d depression in them. Other people are, you know, are different phases in that. So, regardless of the situation when there's change in an organization or in society, we go through some or all of these stages. Another way to look at it is what you might be more familiar with. You've probably seen this in, in uh, previous work that you've done or posts on social media or that, but it's this idea of converting this into an actual curve. So it's a very simplified way of understanding what happens to humans when significant change happens. So what I've done here is I've taken those stages that we've previously looked at, mapped them out on this sort of a curve uh, from start to integration phase. And I call your attention to the left-hand side there, which is tracking our emotional response. So some of our emotional responses are quite active emotionally, and some of them are quite passive emotionally. And so it just, it's just noting where we are in that cycle. Um, essentially, we meander through a maze of emotional responses, never knowing which ones we're going to experience next or whether we'll revisit ones that we've already experienced. And I would suggest in our current global situation, most of us have experienced the shock element and then assortment of the other responses in that. We've kind of been bounced around kind of like a, a ball in a pinball machine, it feels like to me anyway. You know, one day it's this and another time it's that. And we're trying to figure out and, and get to that in, integration stage. We're trying to say, what's the new normal? What is, you know, how are we going to do things? How do we react? How do we respond? And the short of it is we're not quite there yet. So it's, it's difficult to know. Uh, and it's causing us lots of stress in that. And it might be useful right now to consider you know, in this kind of COVID-19 emergency, you and your organization that you're working with and the people that you're working with, what stage of the curve do you think that you are at right now? You know, you're, are you at kind of one of the active emotional ends or one of the passive emotional ends? And which stages have you already passed through? And what actions, resources, or supports do you need in order to move forward towards the integration stage? And also, what actions, resources, or supports do your staff need or those that you're working with, 
coworkers and colleagues need in order to move towards the integration stage. And you might know and you might not know. Another way that we can look at this change in loss curve is to map it in terms of phases. The end phase is the end of what was and what was known. The transition phase, you know, is kind of where we are now with the whole COVID thing, is really unknown. We're kind of trying to find our way the best that we can through that. And then we'll eventually get to what is the beginning of the next phase or the beginning of the new reality. And when we start the curve, we're in fact facing the end of the chapter of what we've been doing in terms of our life and our work and that up to that point. And that's where the loss comes in. That's where the sense of, you know, the discomfort in that as we, as we let go of that or being forced to let go of that, and we move through the discomfort and the ambiguity of the transition phase. And it's often there that people are struggling because, you know, before at some point, you know, we can't really control these things. We don't know what to do. So we move as best we can towards that green phase, that beginning phase. And while we can't necessarily force our way through this process, our control when we reach this place or that place or whatever, we can help the process along uh, by three steps that, I, that I've noticed in myself and others that are useful for working our way through that. The first is realizing it's a natural process. So we can reduce our resistance to it as much as possible because we're not gonna get out of going through it. We have to go through it. So we might as well accept that it's happening and uh, you know, uh, reduce our resistance to it as much as possible. The second part is to not blame, shame, or guilt ourselves for not going through the process faster or for getting stuck here or there or cycling back or whatever. Um, because, you know, in that, you know, with the blame, shame, and guilt, it's not helping anything. So we might need to dial down our inner critic voice if it's getting at us and it's too much. And the third part there is to dial up our sense of self-care, self-patience, self-compassion, and kindness to ourselves for what we're going through, because we're going through a very difficult phase in that. And it's those three steps there, you know, one is go with it, second is dial down the inner critic by not blame, shame, and guilting yourself. The third is dialing up the self-care, self-compassion parts. I suppose what I encourage people to do is to apply the same care of, you know, uh, kindness, compassion, patience, whatever, to yourself that you would be normally applying to other people that would be going through uh, of grieving a loss of something significant in their lives. But it's about applying that to ourselves first as well. So I want you to notice your own personal resilience and I have a little exercise here for you. To think of an example that you're currently experiencing or recently experienced that involves significant challenge, change, or adversity or stress. And think for yourself, what stage are you along that change curve regarding that event? And then think of an example from the past where you successfully negotiated and got to the integration stage. How did you reach that integration stage? What did you do? What were, what were the things that led up to you being able to do that? And how can your past experience of dealing with significant change inform your current experience of going through it? Is there any learning that you can learn from, from that previous experience that you can apply to now, that you can recall and, and remember and use to help you work your way through that, uh, the current change uh, cycle in that? Without any interventions, you'll notice throughout your life that you've bounced back from just about everything that you've experienced that has drained your energy. It might have significantly drained your energy. It may have knocked you out for a while, but you eventually bounced back just like the spring toy. And it's natural to bounce back. And we'll see later that's part of the natural ebb and flow of life, but it, we can influence our ability to bounce back faster, sooner, and we can influence how much energy we're drained of in the process. In particular, I want you to notice the shape of this curve. Notice that it goes down and back up again. And this is a natural shape that we see in many, um, I suppose, many processes in life. Uh, and it's really important that we, that we notice this, that whenever we get knocked down or we're low or, you know, because of change or grief or whatever, we will at some point rebound again. And we've seen that this specific part of the curve already uh, exists in some of the things that we've already looked at. 
like the bounce back, you know, the resilience uh, that's inbuilt in us, that's innate in us as human beings. Uh, in every chain cycle, we bounce back at some point. Um, in fact, the two go in hand in hand. There's the lowness and then there's the bouncing back. And I encourage you, I suppose, as a way of positioning maybe hope or um, some element of, you know, putting a, a positive spin on things a little bit to remember that so far your score for surviving everything that life has thrown at you, no matter what it is, that you've scored a perfect 100% because you're here today. Okay, I'm here today, regardless of what I've been through. You're here today, regardless of whatever you've been through. And in the background of this image, you can see the, a tree stump and the, the tree has been cut down. But even in those circumstances, this tree is attempting to survive by bouncing back, by sending up new shoots. And we do this all the time. It takes us time to heal from the loss of what was, to figure out the ambiguity of the transition stage. But we come back eventually, we survive, we bounce back. And I think it's important to remember that and put that kind of out there so that as we're going through the challenges and difficulties of the current situation, we know that we're going to get there. We don't know what, what there is. You know, it's a whole new world in some ways, but we will get there. And so we, we can take confidence and, and some sense of certainty and security in that. So, so far, just to recap, I'm not finished at all with the models. We've just kind of done the, this one model. I just want to recap a little bit. When humans experience significant loss or change, we move through various stages of the change in loss curve. Uh, it's useful to note how our emotional energy moves up and down in relation to that. Without any intervention, most people move through the curve and arrive in, in, at the integration stage, but we can help that process on. The ups and downs resemble the bounce back of resilience, and it may be helpful to realize that when change happens, we're finishing one chapter, moving through a transition phase until we reach the beginning of the next chapter, which happens fully when we've reached that integration stage, whenever that is. And so far, you've gotten through everything that life is uh, thrown at you. So another model that we want to look at is, you know, like the change cycle, the shape of the uh, stress and recovery cycle is very similar to that. Both are related to resilience in that. Um, we have a wavy line, our energy levels, you know, go up and low, uh, go down at different periods and all that. And anytime, I suppose the, the takeaway from this is that anytime that we expend energy, our stress, our system, mentally or physically or emotionally, we require an equal amount of recovery to bring us back into homeostasis or balance. But we often forget the second half of that equation, and usually at our peril, and usually at my peril, I found oftentimes throughout my life and those of my clients that, you know, we, that I forget to do the recovery stage. So for example, say I stay up to two in the morning watching something interesting or working or whatever, I'll have to sleep till 10 in the morning the next morning to get my eight hours in. But if I don't, and I wake up at seven in the morning instead, well, I haven't recovered my energy fully perhaps. So now I'm in a deficit. And if I carry forward that deficit by continuously doing that behavior, something will eventually have to give. And it's usually not good when it does. This is why people, when they go on holidays, eventually they oftentimes the first few days of the holiday, they're sleeping because they're so exhausted. They've, they've, they've been holding back that recovery period. So we either willingly enter the recovery part of the cycle or nature has a way of doing it for us in the form of illness or injury or sometimes even ill health at the extreme. So if we stay above the line all the time, we're burning out because we're in constant stress, even if it's positive stress. And if we stay below the line all the time, we rust out or we kind of get low or depressed in that because there's not enough positive energy being used. There's not enough positive stressors on our system to activate us. We feel more whole and more uh, in a flow state or in a good place in ourselves when there's an equal um, um, exchange of energy and recovery. So the key is moving our energy to, to, to moving our energy is this oscillation back and forth between stress and recovery. And you can see most of us, if you're like me in the past, most of the time I was staying in stress mode and very little recovery, except maybe at the weekends or maybe there's a holiday or something like that. Whereas the key is to do more regular recovery and to do it in equal proportion to the stress that we're experiencing. If we borrow a bit of learning from sports and performance psychology, it's the fundamental need to use and recover energy that it's about, 
Stress is not necessarily the problem. The issue is the absence of intermittent recovery periods where we can recharge and replenish our baseline mental, uh, emotional, and physical energy. So therefore, energy management is what we be more useful focusing on uh, for our resilience, not so much worrying about the stress. And the best way to do that is to work on practices or rituals that we call them uh, of, of energy recovery so that we can you know, do small things every day throughout the day or throughout the week before or after um, we've had significant drains in our energy. And we can call those rituals of oscillation if you want or rituals of recovery because they're things that we do to move that wave from the stress side of the graph to the recovery side of the graph. Therefore, it's about balancing our stress and recovery to ride that wave of expending energy and recovering the energy. And it's only when we stop surfing that we start to sink. We'll, number, we'll identify a number of specific rituals a, a bit later in the next section that, that will promote that recovery phase. But I just want to kind of, you know, give you a few other ways of looking at the same issue in that. So if you consider recovery basically as recharging your resilience battery, um, just like you do on your phone or your laptop, then you can consider charging or recharging, or even if you've got a, something stressful coming up, pre-charging. And it's this idea of, you know, recovering your, or, or preparing for a stressful event by building up your resilience and, and, and building up the battery and all that. So more generally, we charge our resilience battery through sleep or proper nutrition or having fun or relaxation or being in nature or gentle activities or very vibrant, stimulating activities, whatever it is for you. Um, it's important that you engage in those uh, positive behaviors in order to maintain a healthy balance in that. So as you can see, you're already doing elements of this already, but it might not just be in sync with or in enough depth of recovery to counter the stress that you're experiencing. But some activities that we look, um, that we'll look at in the rest of the course will help you to strengthen, deepen, and in many ways, fast forward that recovery process, turning you into effectively a super duper charger. So you didn't know that that was gonna be a takeaway from today either, did you? Okay, so another useful way of looking at the stress and recovery process is thinking of it in terms of a resilience bank account. So we have the battery idea, but if you also think of the uh, of bank account, so if you have a thousand euros in that bank account and you're making withdrawals of 30 or 50 or 100 euros, you're fine. You're, you've got plenty of cushion in there. You're not really feeling the effects of those withdrawals. But when a 1,200 or 1,500 or 2,000 euro uh, bill comes due, you're found short because there's not enough in the account to counter that. And something has to give and something has to happen. So it's important that we are topping up in small ways throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout your life, um, as well as big ways that we can replenish that bank account and keep it topped up so that those withdrawals don't really have a, a, a massive effect or a debilitating effect on us at all. So, so far, a few things that we've covered are that we've noticed that the, you know, the change in loss curve is similar to the shape of the stress and recovery curve or a cycle. The stress and recovery cycle reminds us that the expenditure of, expenditure of energy in the form of stress must be compensated or paid for by either our resilience reserves or through recharging ourselves. And what we need most are to do or to have rituals of oscillation that will allow us time and activities to recover our energy. Even in the midst of lockdown, even in the midst of quarantine or whatever, we still need to be you know, engaging in activities that replenish us. You can think about it in charging your batteries or having a bank account, whatever way works for you to visualize and to, I suppose, um, you know, understand the concept so that you, you can actively be replenishing those uh, reserves and that. So we've explored the relationship between stress, recovery, and resilience. We've looked at a few models to help us understand those elements and how they relate to one another. Uh, those models were the change in loss curve, stress and recovery cycle, rituals of oscillation and all that. We looked at charging, recharging, and pre-charging. Let's turn our focus now briefly for, to look at the benefits of resilience for ourselves and our organizations and how we can also spot when that resilience is starting to dip down. So we look at the lack of resilience um, or low resilience 
and behaviors so that we can start to spot these things so that we then know it's time to recharge in some way. You feel it in yourself or you'll see it in somebody else, but it's, you know, it's remembering now I need to do something about that and not putting it off. Okay, so what do you think are some of the benefits of organizations having a resilient staff? Well, there's a number of organizations that through research and that I'm not going to read everything because again, you'll have the, the video and I want to maximize our time. But you know, we tend to have stronger supportive individuals and teams, reduction in absenteeism, um, greater uh, self and social awareness, uh, the better ability to manage stress and burnout, and lots of other elements that are there that are positive benefits to having resilient employees, including yourself, including your colleagues uh, throughout the organization. Some of the personal benefits of resilience um, you know, are to, that we, it helps us to stay inspired. We basically stay in a good place in ourselves because we're fully kind of equipped and fully charged up. And so we feel, you know, like we can handle anything. And then when the resilience is low, we feel like almost the opposite of that. You know, how am I going to do this? Um, how am I going to get through this thing, you know, or whatever. Uh, we can stay psychologically and emotionally flexible and increase uh, the mental toughness so that we have greater flexibility uh, mentally and emotionally in that. Uh, we can actively manage uh, change and setbacks and a lot of other personal benefits that are there. So one thing that we want to do is, okay, we're aware of the benefits. Those are kind of um, uh, plain to see in that. But, you know, how do we spot when the, when the resilience needle is starting to kind of move towards empty, uh, uh, moving more towards the low side? So there's a number of behaviors that we can start noticing in ourselves and others around that. We start to you know, these, these unhelpful emotions or what we might call negative emotions start to come to the surface and start to spill out in our behavior. Things like, ag you know, anger or sadness, uh, guilt, shame, anxiety, those sorts of things start to appear when our resilience is low. So, you know, that might you manifest, you know, somebody being afraid of, you know, um, presenting something or being angry when they're criticized or feeling guilty for this, that, or the other, or embarrassed or that. So those are spots, you know, ways of spotting that the resilience is starting to wane a bit and that we need to uh, top up. To spot the complete lack of resilience, it's very similar to that. There's certain emotions in that that come up, you know, but the results of which are that, you know, it has an immediate impact on motivation. You know, we don't feel motivated when we're lacking our resilience. It's, it's kind of gone. We just feel like, you know, what can I do? You know, it, it inhibits us in different ways. You know, it inhibits our behavior in that, our positive behavior we start to you know, get more defensive and more resistant to, to things and challenges and that it can in, you know, impact or impair us mentally and, uh, and in our way of expressing in that. Um, it can damage our well-being and lots of other things. So these are ways to spot it in ourselves and others. Of it's time to top up now. Okay, so with all of that, what is resilience actually made of? Well, we found that while there's no one set kind of list of what um, through research and that there's not really, you know, a defined sense of what, what it is or it isn't, the different systems say different things. There are about 10 components or so that make up resilience. And we, we can, you know, um, we can document that and say that. So there's things like being optimistic, you know, not Pollyanna, but, you know, being, you know, I suppose, you know, um, uh, realistically optimistic. Uh, about things. We can be, you know, altruistic to other people by helping other people, uh, people that have some sort of a moral compass, whether, you know, having a sense of right or wrong, no matter what the system is, tend to be more resilient. They have something to rely on. Same with some people that have a spirituality or a faith or some sort of a belief system tend to be more resilient because, they, again, they have something to rely on, something that informs them that, that's bigger than them. Whether it's true or not or real or not doesn't seem to matter. It's the belief in that that helps them to be resilient. Um, they do things to stretch themselves or to uh, train their resilience. Um, you know, like me, they use something like humor, even if it's black humor. You know, one of the, you know when when I'm doing chemo, you know, and, and that's you know there's there's gallows humor that that's going around the the ward with people and all that, and that's a way of kind of bouncing back and coping with things and dealing with you know um, emotions and, and all that. Uh, people might have somebody that they emulate, like a role model or a mentor, or that, or you know somebody that's uh, supporting them in some way. 
They might have social supports in the community or in their family and that. Um, they face or they embrace their fears, so they you know, allow themselves to be stretched out of their comfort zone from time to time. And they have a sense of meaning or purpose of you know, who they are and you know, what they're about and you know, what they want to do and the value of doing that, and whether it's work or family or whatever. So these 10 components generally you know, are, the, are the ones that build up um, uh, or make up uh, resilience in, in us and that. So to summarize so far, you know, we can use the change in loss curve, stress and recovery cycle, and the resilience bank account as models to help us understand and map what's going on. Um, we don't need to use all of them. Just again, like I said at the beginning, use a piece of one or parts of one or whatever appeals to you. Uh, be aware that those rituals of oscillation that are needed to help us refeed and uh, build up our resilience. There are many personal and organizational benefits to having greater resilience, and we can spot through our behavior when resilience is waning. And resilience is comprised of a range of positive uh, components. The more of those that we have, the stronger our resilience tends to be. And perhaps most importantly, we can learn that we can perceive whether a wheelie bin is levitating in the air or sitting on a footpath. So uh, just to end that section with that. So we've covered quite a lot. I've run through that. I'm mindful of time is getting on there. We have a bit of time left in my part of this um, presentation that so let's pause for a moment just to kind of let you take a breather, um, catch up with things, and ask yourself some of these questions. What concepts or ideas did you learn about in this section that you thought were interesting? Which ones would you be most likely to use in your recovery from stress and shift more towards resilience? And if you started using those concepts or ideas, what impact might they have on your performance at work? or how you show up in your personal life. <clears throat> so just take a moment to jot any notes down or any thoughts down. Anything that might come to mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, phew. Okay, are you still with me? I hope that you are. We've got, uh, I don't think our numbers have waned any, so hopefully people are still there. Uh, you're making great progress, so well done with that. Um, yep, yeah, good note from Kleena there. You're making great progress. So there's a lot to soak in, but you're not off the hook yet. We still have a bit more to do. So let's refresh our brains with another um, uh, teaser in that. Okay, so once again, what do you see? By now you will have guessed that things aren't always you know, as they seem, or are they? I don't know. Uh, I'll read the phrase out to you. <clears throat> it says, the future is... What do you think the next part is? The future is nowhere? Or the future is now here? So can you take a moment and toggle again? Uh, good, thanks, you're still here. Um, and toggle your mind back and forth between seeing that word as nowhere and now here. Okay, just the same way as you did with the duck and the rabbit and the wheelie bin and that. There's a big difference between those two phrases, yet both have exactly the same letters. For me, the lesson in this exercise is that when a situation is ambiguous, like we're in most of the time, it's our interpretation of the reality that completely changes how we respond and how we show up. So you could have read that as now here or nowhere, okay? If you read that as nowhere, you might have gotten, you know, felt yourself kind of get a little bit down in energy in that or feeling a little negative. And because of that, if left unchecked, your thoughts could have primed you to go into the next thing that you do with that state of negativity or lowness or that um, little, little low mood or whatever. And it can influence it in, you know, how you interpret the next thing that you do as a bit more negative. So it affects your filter of how you're seeing things. Or you could have read that it's now here and perhaps gotten a little curious about well, what does that mean? Or a little excited or even positive. Oh, the future is now here. And then you could have brought that glimmer of positivity to the next thing that you do, and it could have grown a bit more and, and spiraled in that. Or a number of whatever combinations of you know, things could have happened. My point is that we can change how we interpret what we see and experience, and that has an effect on how we feel emotionally and how we show up, and that the positive or negative interpretation could eventually spark a beautiful fireworks display or a spiral downward into the depths of darkness. 
we kind of decide and we're kind of in charge of that, whether we realize it or not. One, one tends to help us recharge our resilience battery and the other one, the other interpretation drains it a little bit. What we focus on, what we think and what we perceive and how we perceive something are, how, are ways that it, you know, it, it will affect us uh, emotionally. And you know, I suppose it's another way that we're punching holes in the bucket or filling holes in that bucket. So just a little something there for you. So why have I been teasing you and torching you with duck and rabbit and wheelie bin and now here exercises? Because these are examples of some of the types of easy activities that train your brain towards being more resilient by helping you strengthen the muscle of choice and change and how you see things. Okay, because the brain is shifting from what it would normally do to alternating to two different realities, and that strengthens the muscle of attention and awareness. Um, to be clear, these exercises help you to develop your ability to put focus and awareness intentionally on one thing or another and strengthen that neural pathway. But don't take my word for it. As, as the Mayo Clinic says, one of the best ways to improving your resilience is to train your attention and your awareness, and that's exactly how we're doing that. So how does that improve mental... Uh, um, mental toughness and resilience. It helps you to strengthen those muscles, takes you off of autopilot, puts you more into being aware and, uh, of the situation that's happening and that you have a choice in how you're interpreting that. And you have a choice about building up the resilience back account or draining it a bit. And that's very important. So we're getting into the home stretch nearly there. We're looking at now some exercises, some tools that we'll be able to use. So over the next, um, number of minutes there. If I run out of time, what I'm going to, I was telling Kleena, what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish recording the, the rest of the tools if I don't get to all of them, and they'll be on the final video there. So if I don't get to everyone um, in the time that's left, be rest assured when you see the final video, all the different tools will be there for your use in that. So um, something to keep in mind there, I'm just watching the, the problem is that life doesn't get easier or more forgiving necessarily, but we get stronger and more resilient in response to it. It's just another interpretation there. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of my favorite images um, that represents resilience for me is that of the bonsai tree. Originally before they became a miniature um, little, uh, little tree that you'd see in an office or that, they grew on the cliff hangs in the, in the wild wilderness and that, often in very inhospitable weather uh, and that in conditions. And it's almost miraculous how they could survive the harsh and unpredictable climates, but they did. Often twisted and knurled from the elements, they stretched in strange directions to glimpse whatever available sunshine or, or, or nurturing or nutrition that they could get um, that was necessary for their survival. <coughs> Excuse me. So for me, they symbolize strength, overcoming difficulties and hardships, as well as poise, beauty, and elegance in the face of adversity. For me, they're a great reminder of how just amazingly resilient we are as humans, and that we too can overcome and become stronger from stress, pressure, and challenges of life. The interesting thing about the bonsai tree is that there's kind of two varieties. There's the weathered natural one that grows in nature, and responds uh, to the elements and the elements form it. And the other, the second one, the picture there is one that's pruned or cultivated and nurtured by humans. So in some ways, you know, we can kind of imagine that we're kind of like that bonsai tree. We're kind of like a human bonsai tree. Up to now, your resilience has been weathered and influenced by life. But going forward, you have the opportunity to cultivate and grow your own resilience to bear fruit for whatever you need uh, resilience for in your life. So again, we have the benefit of both of those uh, things there now. So we're going to look at how we build resilience now. Okay, we're going to look at what are the 10 ways to build resilience now. And these, again, are drawn from the American Psychological Association. So there's research behind it and all that. So I'll just run through these very quickly. Um, and then you can kind of go back to them as you need to. So there's 10 ways of doing things right now. And some of these you're already doing, which is great. But we want to increase those things. So you know, making connections, you know, good relationships with people is important. That's been, you know, paused a little bit because of COVID, but, you know, maintaining those relationships however you can helps us to um, have a resilience now. 
we can avoid seeing crises as, as insurmountable problems. We can reframe that a little bit in that they're not always, you know, problems that are there. Um, we can accept that change is a part of living so that, you know, we can, it's just part of the natural occurrence of life. We saw that in the, in the, uh, in the change uh, curve and that. We can move towards goals, you know, by setting goals, it gives us a sense of certainty and security as we, as we move towards them. We can take decisive action instead of being immobilized. So, you know, taking action, taking responsibility gives us, again, a sense of control and boosts our system in that. We can look for opportunities for self-discovery, you know, ways of developing ourselves, you know, hobbies or interests or different things because it adds to our sense of self-worth and um, in that. We can nurture a positive view of ourselves. So that helps us to develop confidence in our ability to solve problems, our trust our instincts, and that all helps us to, to build um, resilience. We can practice keeping things in perspective. So when we're in the face of stressful or painful events, we can try to consider the stressful situation in a broader context to keep a long-term perspective, kind of like what I was saying earlier, you know, kind of put something out there to kind of give us a bit of hope. Therefore, that we're not, you know, only tied into looking at what the, uh, what the current situation is. You know, we can maintain a hopeful outlook as well. So being realistically optimistic enables us to expect good things instead of only expecting negative things to happen. And one of the most important things that you're doing today is you can take care of yourself by paying attention to your own needs and feelings, recharging when you need to, doing activities like exercise or nutrition or a rest or those things that, that build you and, and support you um, and, in, in what you're doing. And that all builds your resilience as well. And then there's additional ways that you can find, you know, for example, some people, you know, journal and write their feelings and get them out, you know, so they're not kind of bouncing around inside of them. Um, other people take up practices, you know, like sports or meditation or swimming or whatever it is. All of that helps you to build, you know, connections, restore hope and have a sense of control and certainty and all that in your life. So there's 10 ways that many of which you're probably doing part, partly now, but there's 10 ways to build resilience right now. There's another way of looking at things. This, this is drawn from Helen McGraw's work in Australia. She works a lot with resilience with young people, and she came up with kind of this, uh, this um, acronym, you know, bounce back as a way of uh, developing or helping us to remind ourselves around resilience in that. So B is bad times don't last, things get better. O is other people can uh, only help if you share with them. Unhelpful thinking only makes you feel worse. Nobody's perfect, not you, not your friends, not anyone. Uh, concentrate on good things in life, no matter how small. Everybody suffers, everybody feels pain and experiences setbacks. They're a normal part of life. We need to blame fairly that, you know, negative events happen. You know, there might be a combination of something we did, something other people did, and just the way that things turn out. Accept what you can't change and try to change what you can. Catastrophizing makes things worse. Don't fall prey of uh, believing in the worst interpretation. And keep things in perspective. Even in the worst moment, um, it's just a moment in life. So there's, there's, there's lots, of, um, lots of things that we can take from that. And it's kind of in simplified language because it's meant for young people, but it's, it's still very powerful in that. Okay, I'm noticing that my time is going, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on here. So there's summarize, we've got a lot of things there. Humans tend to have our heads in the sand and that we have various models and lists that can help us map where we are so that we can help where we uh, see where we're going. Uh, up to now, life has determined your level of resilience, but going forward, you can determine that and you can decide how best you can bear fruit. There's at least 10 ways to build your resilience some of them that you're already doing, but you can start things today to build that up and build your repertoire. And again, just as part of a, a bit of humorous there, you can, you can perceive the difference between, you know, now here and, and nowhere, and you can change that perspective uh, to, to get an outcome that's better for you. So in this brief section, think about what you found was useful and how you can nurture or grow your own resilience. So what are the part of the 10 ways that you already do and some things, you know, from that list of 10 that you can do to build your resilience and add to your resilience repertoire. So just take a moment just to jot anything down there 
before we move to the, to the next section there. Good stuff, a lot of good comments there, thank you. Okay, home stretch. We're gonna go into the, uh, the different exercises now. I'm gonna get through as many as I can and get to the, uh, hopefully land us um, safely uh, in the next few minutes there with the end of the presentation. So nice little quote from Brene Brown, uh, joy collected over time fuels resilience. I think that's just wonderful. Again, it just goes to this understanding that the state that we're in, whether it's positive uh, and helpful or stressful and maybe, you know, veering towards the negativity bias that we, that we might have, you know, determines, uh, you know, how much resilience we have. So joy helps us to build that up uh, in a nice way. So we're going to look at different exercises for growing your resilience. And you'd be glad to know you've had a few of those examples already, but we're going to put a few more in your toolbox. There's six different categories in terms of developing mental toughness and resilience that we tend to work through uh, and that. And, you know, we, you've, you've already looked at three of these. We've already done some work in positive thinking and visualization and anxiety control. Well, those are the, going to be the ones that we're going to focus on the most in that. We've already done some work in intentional control and self-awareness. I'm not going to cover goal setting today because as professionals, <clears throat> you've got loads of tools and, and, and that for, for that. But let's just look at what we've already done. So you've already explored self-awareness through the different models that we've used to help you map things, to help kind of spot resilience when it's getting lower, when it's uh, existing in that. We've got the bank account, we've got resilience battery and all that. Regarding attentional control, we've done things like the duck and rabbit and the floating wheelie bin and, and all that. All those can be used to you know, uh, adjust your ability to focus on what you tell your mind to focus on instead of just what comes into your mind. And the stop technique is part of an awareness exercise drawn from the positive thinking category as well. So you're well on your way. If you just practice some of those things or find phone apps or fun things on Facebook or whatever that help you reinforce those, it'll help to develop that muscle, which is really, really important. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting the gravel out of my voice there. Okay, so positive thinking, we're just gonna look at that for a moment there. Um, it's, it's not a platitude at all, it's, it's, a, it's a mental attitude. And it's, it's quite useful and quite important. We have this thing called a negativity bias that keeps us safe. So you might be aware of that, you know, it keeps us away from the, from the tigers and the bears and all that sort of stuff that our predecessors, you know, had to deal with in that. But in modern society, that's running all the time and it's not necessarily useful or helpful. We're not always going to be, you know, in danger, mortal danger of something happening. So we have to kind of re reset that or rebalance that by what's called a positivity offset. So, you know, that's, this is what, in, I suppose, in the spirit of what I'm speaking when I speak about positivity, I'm not meaning Pollyanna sort of thinking. I'm meaning looking at the full context. Yes, there's a negative side to things, but there's also a positive side to things or a benefit or that that could be there in the situation. And it's only when we're looking fully at the whole situation, the negative and the positive, that we get a real sense of what actions we can take or what you know what directions we can go with it. So we want to constantly be resetting that uh, negativity bias and balancing it with a positivity offset in that. So that's essentially what we're what I'm meaning there. Um, and this quote from Fiona Brennan, uh, who wrote the book called The Positivity ha Habit, and that says that the positivity offset is one of the most direct and immediate methods positive people use to diminish unnecessary negativity because it's not always useful to, or helpful, or even realistic to be looking at the negative side of things all the time, even though that's generally what's brought to us by media and organizations and what have you. So the underlying principle is that we are what we think, you know, so we become what we think, so we start to generate positive chemicals in our body or stress chemicals in our body. So when we're operating from the positive chemicals, we're more in a flow state, we're in a better mental state, and we're more able to deal with things. So we're more resilient. When we're dealing with the negative chemicals, we tend to have a very narrow view, kind of a tunnel view of things, and we very limited in terms of how, of options that we see available to us in that. So it's about bringing that realistic optimism in to give us a broader sense of, of the situation in its fullest sense. So I have a few exercise that, exercises that I'm going to run through here 
and take a, a few moments on. They're going to be fully detailed in the notes here. You'll be able to go back to them in the in the video and that um, to to replay them and to see that. So the the first one is the think of three positives. So this is just again trying to balance that positivity offset. Um, you know, so but you can do it simply by thinking of three things. You know, from yesterday that were positive. So we mem remember the problems and our critic is kind of screaming at us that we did that and we shouldn't have done that. So this is reteaching that and re-strengthening re re that. So when you finish the day, think about three things that you enjoyed or that went well that day. Uh, at the start of the day, maybe think about three things that are positive in the coming day. In a difficult situation, perhaps, you know, reflect on three positives about that situation. Even though it's a stressful or difficult situation, there's still probably some positives in there. And it's this sort of, you know, uh, practice of noticing that um, that helps you to build up, um, you know, I suppose the full sense of, of, of what you're seeing and what, what's available to you in terms of resources uh, in yourself and in the situation. Another way to, to do this is something I call the positive reframe. So if you can read Chinese, you'll recognize that these are two traditional kanji characters from the Chinese and Japanese language. And it was long thought in Western culture that these words in particular stood for the word, you know, crisis. And, you know, the, the thing that crisis also means opportunity. Well, we know with better translations that that's not really what it means. It means, you know, something a little bit deeper than that. But that's still a useful idea, this, this sense of, well, that a crisis can also be an opportunity. You know, that challenging situations may have a threat, but there may also be opportunities in there. So depending on our, our perspective and interpretation, we can see, you know, the silver lining in the cloud and the, the good in the situation and all that. We call that positive reframing or just reframing or that. Another example of that would be, you know, the sense of, you know, what are we looking at? So this two-headed principle to overcome our negativity bias helps us to flip the perspective and recognize the value or the potential benefit in a situation instead of just the downside. So here we have two prisoners. One's looking out the window and seeing the bars of the prison, and the other one's looking past that and seeing the, the, the beauty of the nature outside. So again, just this reframing technique and that. Um, so another technique is called NATS, and you may have heard of this from, again, I think it comes from cognitive behavior therapy and that. But it's this idea of we have all these thoughts, these negative thoughts going around in our head oftentimes. And so what do we do with them? You know, they're influencing us. They're kind of lowering our energy. They're draining our resilience and all that. So how can we, how can we develop a method for dealing with these to minimize them? Because they're not usually helpful. And the way to do that is to, um, to be able to, you know, recognize what they are. So they're, they're always negative. They always make you feel bad about yourself. They're self-sabotaging. You know, there sometimes there's a kernel of truth in there, so they're slightly believable. So that kind of sucks us in, and they're almost always negatively biased against yourself. So in order to counter these, because they're not necessarily true, they're not you know just because we think things doesn't mean it's true. Um, we need to kind of look at a little bit further, and there's three things that we can do with these negative automatic thoughts, these gnats, and we can catch them, we can count them, and we can counter them. Okay, so. You know, we can catch them by noticing when we feel, uh, you know, not okay or that. We can identify what was the thinking just before that. So what led up to that? What triggered us into that negative thought? Um, you know, we can will eventually catch us, you know, that dialogue, that inner critic dialogue happening in that. And if we catch them, then we can start counting them. So some people, I have some clients that have noticed the themes that are happening for them, you know, themes of I'm not good enough or I'm to this or I'm not enough of that or whatever it is. And then they start counting them. And by counting them, you, you take a lot of the power out of them. You know, so, you know, we can, we can count, well, I've got, I had, you know, three in that category and 10 in that category or, or whatever. And it gives us some sense of control over them. And then we can start to counter them by writing them down, noticing the patterns, and counting them by saying, well, that's not true, or that's not completely true, um, or that's not very helpful, so I'm not going to keep thinking that. Or there might be a little truth in that, but so what? Everybody has, you know, shortcomings and whatever. So, you know, by doing that, we can really 
change our self-talk, our, our, you know, we can dial down the critic, we can dial up the self-compassion, and that helps to, uh, to balance that. Another technique that we use, and we're just at the half past mark here, I'm just gonna do a couple more techniques very quickly, is the stop technique. And that one we used earlier, you know, where we just kind of notice a negative thought coming up and we just say stop to that. And the importance here is that we're breaking the pattern. We're kind of taking the, the, the thing that will shoot down our mood or our energy or our resilience and we're putting a stop to it there. Um, so that's, that's an important thing to do as well. Um, we're okay for a few more minutes. Thank you. Um, another thing that we can do, and again, these are very simple. They're very, you know, very, very simple. They're drawn from different disciplines and therapies and, and research and that. So they're very quick and simple. There's no, there's no need for some big, you know, um, a big process to develop our resilience. It happens in the moment. It happens moment to moment. And these are techniques that help you, you know, get control in that. Another thing that we can do is to use, you know, guided imagery and visualization. Some people dismiss it as being fluff or that, and that's fine until I suggest that you imagine biting into a lemon or ask you to imagine eating your favorite food and then get you to notice that your body is already starting to react on a physical level by imagining the food and therefore possibly increasing the saliva in your mouth. So, you know, you, you know, just looking at the picture or thinking of that has a physiological change or that, you know, so you can pleasantly think of a meal or you can unpleasantly imagine a particular food in your mouth and you see that the reaction happens. So visualization and guided imagery has a direct effect on physical and on your physical and emotional state. So the underlying principle here is that we can imagine success or we can imagine failure. The choice is ours. And we can use it to, you know, increase relaxation, prepare for stressful events, you know, by rehearsing, mental rehearsal of that. We can deal with challenging situations or we can increase our creativity. And a little exercise, I'll just, it just takes a minute, um, I'll go through with you, is something like the safe haven. And this is to, to develop relaxation in that. So if you just, I know I'm rushing through things and so I'm gonna pause now. If you can allow your mind to enter a place that's special for you, some place that you enjoy or can be real or imaginary, maybe a holiday or a place that you go for walks or, or some place in your, in your home that's safe and comfortable in that. And choose somewhere maybe that you, visit, that you visited or that you'd like to visit and allow your mind to drift to that. And notice where you feel peace or relaxation in your body and just focus on that sensation in your body for a moment. And over time when you're doing this, you can stay there as long as you want and just keep focusing in on that relaxation that you might feel. It might be in your shoulders, it might be in your belly, wherever it is. And then you can just come back out of that and come back to the present moment. And then notice any shifts or changes. And if you do that for long enough, you will shift your biochemistry from stress chemicals into the more relaxation chemicals. And it's just a good way to, 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 I suppose, to a good example that you have control over that and that you can, you can choose that and you can do things sitting in the car, sitting you know, before a meeting, and you can do things like this to regroup yourself, to center, to build up those positive chemicals so that you're in that flow state, you're in that positive state instead of a negative state, which is draining your resilience. So there's a number of uh, things there. Another thing that we can do is appreciation triggers. So this is about using imagery to be able to trigger and elicit you know, positive feelings in, in us and our positive mental states. These are a couple of screenshots of my computer screen. Um, the one on the left is when I was going through chemo the first time. You know, I had places that we visited in Crete and different things that make me smile or make me happy, you know, flowers or puppies or sunshine or whatever it is for you. And I had them on my computer screen so that I was facing them all the time. And they were having, you know, when something was happening, I could focus in on one of those images. And it was just something in the moment. Some people keep images on their phones. You have clients that will have, you know, a, a, a file in their phone with positive images. It might be family, it might be, you know, vacations or holidays that they've been on or whatever. And so it just kind of keeps them, uh, gives them a, a, a tool of that to kind of be able to do that. Okay. Um, so there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways that we can use these things or, or suggest to others that they use them. 
the one on the right is a holiday that we went on in mainland Greece. You can tell that we like Greece a lot. And, you know, my wife and I climbed this hill to this temple of Poseidon, and we could see the, the panoramic view of the sunset and the horizon and the islands and all that. And so I have positive feelings from that experience that I lived, and I can relive it in the moment to kind of set me up for a stressful event. You know, it helps me to pre-charge or recharge after I've had um, some stress or facing some stress. So there's a number of things like that that we can do that are very simple. You can have them on your computer, on your phone. You, you can revisit them. But the, the point is that we have to take the action of revisiting them or setting these things up so that we have those triggers into um, um, you know, our resilience instead of being pulling, uh, pulling us out of our resilience or putting another hole in the bucket by not doing something like this. Okay, so there's just, there's just um, one or two more there. We look at anxiety control and there we're talking about things like the pause technique, which is similar to the stop technique. The pause technique is about, you know, the, the thoughts or the feelings that come up in us. If you can feel that you've been triggered by something that someone said or an event, you can, you can learn to pause that, um, that stimulus, uh, I suppose that, that, uh, that stimulus that's happening, you know, the effect of that, you can pause it by, recognizing it by breathing, by you know, whatever that you can do to interrupt again that pattern so that you don't react um, in the way that you might typically react to, you know, to that stressor or to that you know, stimulus and that, that you pause instead so that you can choose a response that's appropriate to the event so that you can, you know, somebody's saying something, something's doing something or something's happening and you can choose in that moment to just pause, to breathe for a moment, to just let that settle. And then you can choose a response when you're kind of in your right place in yourself, as opposed to just reacting uh, from being, you know, um, uh, stressed or, 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 or a usual reaction that you might have to a person or to an event. So you can interrupt that and that's very powerful. And the last one that I give you, again, these, are, these aren't rocket science. This is simple things you can do in a queue, you can do while you're driving, you can do at any point at time. The last one here is the smile and laugh. So, you know, viewing, uh, uh, you know, someone smiling, we tend to smile with a smile that carries with it again, a switch from stress chemicals to positive chemicals in that in our body. Uh, apparently 14% of us smile fewer than five times a day. So this is a free way of getting a boost of good chemicals in your body and we don't use it. But children win the smile game because they smile as many as 400 times a day. So why are we always often viewing children as being happy? It's because they're smiling a lot, you know, is one thing. They're smiling because of their interpretation of the world, but also because it's in their nature to smile. And we can take that and re remember that and use that as a way of pre-charging and recharging in that. It sounds simplistic. It sounds silly. But if you try it, if you sit there and you smile, you'll start to notice a shift in those chemicals in your body. And they'll put you in a flow state, they'll put you in a better place in your mind and in your emotions and that to respond to whatever um, you're doing at the time. So, and it's, it, and it's a, a cheap way of doing it. It's, it's, it's there and it's available to you, okay? So to summarize very quickly, we've done a lot of tools and techniques around self-awareness and intentional control and positive thinking and visualization and anxiety control. Now I want to invite you in the last couple of minutes here that I'm going to speak around putting it all together. Okay, so we want to put it together. We've got these outer activities of the ways of building, building resilience now and you know the components of resilience in that. And then we've got these inner environment activities of all these different um, tools and that that we have. Um, so it's, you know, we, what we want to do, like the bonsai trees, we want to combine these things, you know, the outer activities and the inner environment activities to build an incredibly strong foundation of resilience that will not only help you deal with your current stage of wherever you are in that change and loss curve, but also help you to navigate through the marathon that's coming of the coming months of the new normal. We don't know when that's going to, you know, finally resolve in that. So you know, you have these tools available to you now. It's a matter of using them and putting them into place so that, you know, you, you strengthen your bucket and you, in fact, are building a well 
of activity to draw from uh, over time, but it takes time and repetition to, to develop these things. So with all that we've covered, I would invite you to consider, you know, what is your personal resilience development plan going to look like? You know, how do you map where you currently are with re your resilience? What level of resilience do you need for the path ahead? You know, where are you at on that change and loss curve? How will you charge, recharge, and pre-charge? What are the 10 ways, you know, what of those 10 ways will you use? Um, you know, what resilience exercises will you use? And how will you document that and be accountable to that? How will you monitor your progress? So these are all big questions I know, and they take, they take, um, you know, they take, uh, you know, uh, time to do and work out and that. So what, one of the things that we're going to do is after this program is, you know, we want to encourage you to implement these things and maybe document or have an accountability partner or whatever, you know, works for you. But in addition to that, what we're going to do is we're going to support you in integrating what you've learned um, by offering you a series of eight emails. It'd be one a week over eight weeks which you know I'll, I'll i'll be writing those emails and i'll be recapping some of these things and encouraging you over you know the, the, the course of a couple of months to to start to engage with these things and remind you to use them and all that so that you you know are supported in doing that so that this doesn't stay on the shelf but actually gets used and, and gets you know made up of the fabric of who you are so i'm going to give those emails to to Kleena. he'll send them out to you um, to anyone, to everyone that's attending today that wants to participate in it um, and, and all that. And that way it stays private. You know, I don't have your emails or anything like that. But you can, of course, you know, opt out of the series if you want. If you don't want to participate in that, you just let Clean and know and that's fine. But it's an extra support that we want to provide for you to help you through that. So for me, you know, I suppose I'm that's my input. There's a lot there. Apologies for running over time so much. Just take a moment to pause before we get into the Q&A to consider what you've learned today and how, what's been useful for you. And what will be the first things that you will put into practice that you'll use? And just consider that for a moment. And I'll leave you with this. You know, I'm not telling you that it's going to be easy to do these things in the, in the face of all the challenges that you have, but I'm telling you it's going to be worth it setting the time aside to do these things, to set up your resilience plan, to put these things into action over the coming weeks and months and that. So I want to thank you, um, um, you know, for, for your attention, for your time and your energy today. I want to thank the Mental Health and Wellbeing subgroup. Uh, and to, to uh, Joy and Cleaner for inviting me here to work with you today. I'll leave you with this quote. It says, challenges are what make life interesting. Overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. So please, if you want to get in touch, my details are on the screen. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Drop me a note. I'd love to hear how you found the session and that. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, your time and, and everything. And um, I suppose we move now and the time that's left into the Q&A session. And uh, I suppose Kleena and Joy can unmute and we'll do that uh, in the time that we have. Apologies for running over. I'm gonna pause the recording now so that we can um, do the um, Q&A without um, things being put on record there, okay? And I hope that you um, read them and use them. And again, take the 10 or 15 minutes when you get that to do that piece of self-care. Um, we are gonna be having a similar webinar now for practitioners on October the 20th. Um, so again, if there's people in your organization um, who you think would benefit, I think the invitation has already gone out. And this whole webinar is going to be up on the SIPSI website shortly, and we'll distribute the link when we get that. So that's it. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. And I know I can see from some of the comments, it's reminding us of things that we already know. Um, and it's just refreshing that and reminding us of how important it is for us to mind ourselves. And if we mind ourselves, we can mind our staff and then our staff can mind the children and families who they're working with. And ultimately that is the goal here. It's very much about how is it that we deliver the best service that we can for children and families despite all the difficulties. 
and this is a part of it and it's a really important part. So thank you all and we'll leave it at that. Very good, thank you all. And thanks for your attention and everything. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for Joy and Cleaner for inviting me here today. And uh, I'm glad that you got benefit from it. And um, I look forward to hearing how you do and, and, and um, all that in the future. So have a great day and have a great uh, uh, next few weeks in that. All the best.